if we can have, uh, we can have uh, more comments, or we'll also open the floor if you want more questions. Yes, please. Actually, I have a very little comment to make, and I um, both in agreement with the two-way Ming, except on uh, one point, and that is a reappraisal of the enlightenment mentality to which he alluded. And I believe that uh, there needs to be a much more in-depth critique of that mentality uh, which has led to the consequences that we're facing today than most Muslim or Chinese scholars have undertaken. Uh, this is a process that is not going on within the Islamic world. I do not know the Chinese world well enough to be able to comment upon it, but I think it's one of the prime duties of serious intellectuals and thinkers in both worlds to be able to provide an in-depth rather than simply fashionable uh, understanding. For example, now that in the West you have deconstructionism and postmodernism and certain critics of uh, the Enlightenment, especially from France, well, and many people in the East are just emulating them, copying them, and tomorrow another wave is going to come out and something else will come. Uh, it's important that this, this critique be based upon our own intellectual traditions. Otherwise, I, I, I agree completely with Mr. Tuwe Ming, and I hope that this process of being able to uh, stand on our own feet in the, in, amidst this incredible crisis that all of humanity is facing will continue. The new institute, I think, is going to play a very important role as far as China is concerned in this inter-civilizational dialogue. I know it's quite natural that there should be close dialogue between India and China concerning the importance of Buddhism, of course, but I think the dialogue between China and the Islamic world, from a geopolitical point of view, is even more important for, for the Chinese as it is for the Islamic world, and perhaps that will also push that dialogue as well. Uh, sometimes a little bit disagreement between friends uh, is exciting. Uh, let me look at the Chinese situation. Uh, to me, it's an agonizing situation. I don't look at it objectively. I can't. I look at it as a personal understanding. But I make a very clear distinction between personal and private. Uh, if we, uh, this is my private thought, I'm not going to share with anyone, such as my diary or my fanciful ideas. Personal meaning I'm experientially, existentially committed. And I think that view is uh, discussable, arguable, hopefully public, accountable, but also falsifiable. So uh, this is my uh, understanding of the Chinese case. Uh, since the Opium War, the coming of the West, 13, uh, uh, 1839, until the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, for that 110 years, this is Chinese experience, different from the Islamic experience. Because I think in, in the Islamic world, the sense of cultural identity, the sense of being part of a different kind of universe, the assertion of our otherness, and as a critique of the West, the Chinese situation is different. So in that 10 year, in that 110 year period, every 10 day, every 10 years, there was a major change in the Chinese situation. Not just cultural change, just social, political, economic change. After the founding of the People's Republic from uh, 1949 to the reform open policy of 1979, we're talking about 30 years, but every five year period, there's major transformation. The Korean War, followed by the Great Leap Forward, which uh, turned out to be economically, economically and politically disastrous, and then uh, the three years of real famine, about 30 million, maybe even more, died of starvation. And then the Cultural Revolution, that the culture was wiped out. And then, of course, the later part of the Cultural Revolution and uh, Mao became such an aggressive and self-asserted uh, force in uh, transforming China totally at a tremendous expense of the Chinese, not the Chinese environment, the Chinese politics, of the Chinese soul. Uh, this is a very graphic image. The Mao once said, 
if China becomes industrialized, like England, like other places, China then will be proud as a member of uh, the international community. My vision, Mao's vision, is to stand on the Tiananmen and look beyond. So all the chimneys of the industrial organizations will be there. Then I will consider China's made it. The idea of made it is uh, industrialization with all the pollution uh, that we generate. And of course, uh, there's no sensitivity to ecological problems. So with this, this kind of uh, situation, the strategy to try to face up to the challenge will have to be two parts. The first part, you want to have some kind of communication with uh, the intellectual and uh, political elite. That communication involves what I would consider a sympathetic understanding. It's very difficult, it's painfully difficult. Sympathetic understanding what happened in the West. But more important is not that sympathetic understanding, it's only the first phase, but a critical reflection. And a critical reflection by mobilizing your indigenous traditions. And in so doing, you challenge the West, not from the point of view of radical otherness, but of course radical otherness is important. The challenge in the West to say, I understand what I have. I can even appreciate some of the things you did. However, the particular kind of mentality which is now so powerful and so much embraced by East Asian minds will have to be not only undermined, but will have to be thoroughly critiqued. I think Dr. Nasa started many, many decades ago when he was probably a graduate student in Harvard became really sensitive to the ecological issues. That's very, very prophetic. I think he became sensitive because he was sensitive to the human condition. This, to the human condition, is beyond all major organized religions. It's a spiritual force, probably informed by Sufism, or some very powerful spiritual force in trying to understand this. And right now, I think, uh, maybe share uh, encouraging news. And even before the Institute was formally established, a group in Turkey is, is uh, we approached by a group in Turkey. Uh, they would like to establish a chair in uh, Sufi studies, broadly defined. Uh, the university already is very uh, encouraging, uh, very re receptive to this idea. We, in the very beginning, to try to think about it. So I hope, a few years from now, uh, Peking University will not simply a university overwhelmed by the Enlightenment mentality. It is still overwhelmed by that, uh, with sometimes with uh, radically different uh, visions, uh, like Professor Nasser's uh, visit, uh, actually last year during the Beijing Forum. It's perhaps the largest forum in China. And uh, more than 300 eminent scholars were invited. And it's a combination of not only Peking University, but the government of uh, Beijing, and with the support of uh, foundations, even from foundations of, uh, in Korea. And uh, Dr. Nasser was invited to give the keynote, and there are only two or three keynotes for this particular audience. And I was fortunate, uh, they also arranged uh, a dialogue. And he arrived uh, previous day, he gave the keynote in the morning, and a dialogue with me in the afternoon, and uh, I didn't see any sign that he was uh, uh, tired, and he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, fall asleep, which to me was really rather remarkable. And uh, maybe we should open up uh, for questions and answers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, please identify yourself. I will say, uh, Mr. Ziyad, uh, I'm a member of the board of the Senate, and then next to the office. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Ziyad Aradad, I'm the former director of operations at the World Bank. First of all, um, both your uh, uh, discourses were absolutely thrilling. But I have a very fundamental question, and allow me the audacity while agreeing with you to also challenge you. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, similarities in metaphysics, cosmology, and ethics. Um, to what extent do these similarities in the two schools of thought go beyond what is common human aspiration? My, my the Gnostic nature in, in, within me tells me there's a lot more, but I don't understand. And if it's a really fundamental question, what is unique about these similarities, uh, which is more unique than perhaps uh, what can happen to the other I do not believe that the idea that similarities are simply based on the similarity of human nature suffices. Human nature is too fluid to be permanent. It needs something else. And any kind of humanism which does not look upon the spiritual element within the human being uh, is bound not to succeed. Now, these similarities which, which uh, you just mentioned, and I mentioned in my small talk, are not only based on similarities of human nature, they're based on something more profound. It is true that there are also other very profound similarities with other traditions. For example, between India and the Islamic world. I've given over 10 lectures in India over decades on this very, very question, and there are also very profound similarities there. And this brings us to the profound question of similarities between the heavenly messages which have molded human souls in different societies. And therefore, the question of similarity, uh, structural and also metaphysical similarity between various religions of the world, which in fact have made it possible for the followers to display these similarities. Now, that's, of course, a very important central story, but it's really a story for another day. But I believe the key to similarity is not only between Islam and Confucianism, but uh, between Islam and other religions of the world, or confusion among the great religions of the world, is not the commonality of human nature. It is the divine imprint upon human nature. And similarity in different imprints, which throughout history, various human collectivities and within various civilizations have received. My answer will be uh, relatively brief. What, ha what actually happened now is something that actually occurred quite some time ago. Uh, in the early part of the Enlightenment, I said uh, uh, confusion and contribution was significant. Uh, recently, a book by uh, Nathan Israel is called Enlightenment, Enlightenment Contested. In that book, he talked about the emergence of the Enlightenment immediately recognized by these uh, great uh, Western minds of two traditions, uh, Islam and Confucianism, as the other. So when these traditions were perceived as the other, and the possibility of a profound reflections uh, on the West uh, became more powerful than, say, Hinduism, and many other traditions. And it is in this sense when you become relegated to the background on the surface as otherness. But this is only part of the story. Uh, a much more important story is Dr. Nasser's idea. In my study of uh, Liu Tzu, the question almost is like that. Uh, Liu Tzu followed the, uh, what the Confucian considered a major project of human flourishing, uh, starting from uh, even a person in fetus, or even even started with uh, the animal world or the plants and so forth. It's a gradual process, and uh, you could see all kinds of uh, points of convergence through this kind of narrative. But then the question about beyond. In other words, uh, the real dialogue, which may turn out to be the most challenging, and of course all kinds of. Uh, uh, wrong conceptions may emerge. That is at the cosmological and metaphysical level, and how the Confucian world will be able to appreciate heaven not simply as uh, some reality out there, but as an integral part of our experience, but continuous source of inspiration. And therefore, you can even say creativity in itself. 
Now that aspect, which is taken for granted in the Islamic world, is something still quite new, uh, not alien, quite new. So this learning is extremely important. Uh, on the other hand, the question of practicality, how you, how you uh, do uh, your major work in the ordinary existence of uh, the daily life, it's something that the Confucian tradition continued over a very long period of time. That's one of the reasons why many people just assume that the tradition is secular and the tradition is not a spiritual humanism. And so there's a great deal of uh, mutual interaction. But the last point I want to simply know is that all spiritual traditions confronted with emergence of what we can call the sacredness of the earth will have to transform themselves. And in a, let's use two examples, the Christian and, uh, and the uh, Buddhist. The Christian tradition can no longer assert waiting for the kingdom of God yet to come. Let's pollute this place, because after all, it's the world of Caesar. And the Buddhists will not, will not be able to say, let's wait for the pure land, for the other shore. This is red dust. So all the traditions will have to develop two languages, a language specific to your religious tradition, but also the language of global citizenship in facing, especially the Earth emerge, especially in our generation. We can see it holistically, from the mineral, soil, water, right now air. And we, as humans, now have to recognize, turn out to be not only, not just co-creators in a positive sense, but the most, most powerful destructive force, not only for ourselves, but also for the cosmos as a whole. There's an old Confucian statement that if there are disasters, human beings will survive, especially disasters from nature, because there's loving care, basically pervasive in the nature, they are in, in the natural process. But if uh, the disaster is man-made, we would not be able to survive. I don't hear you. Uh, but my question is about the scientism or social engineering that Professor Fermi has discussed quite a bit. Uh, if there is more scientism in East Asia, China, Korea, and uh, Japan, why? Uh, that part of the historical uh, process, because the West also had uh, a lot of scientists, as you remember from socialism and communism. And I wonder what, what makes current uh, East Asia have a more problem with scientism than here in America or the West, and I'd like to know And second, I wonder whether uh, the Confucian paternalism uh, is uh, one of the elements, one of the reasons why uh, East Asia has a uh, a different kind of uh, uh, scientism or social engineering. It's not exactly like uh, what we have observed uh, socialism or communism. But uh, the scientism we see here in Asia is uh, a little bit different from that. So I was wondering uh, what is your comment and your opinion about whether the Confucian paternalism or sort of uh, deviated from uh, paternalism different Talk about constant All right, it's a challenging question. I would uh, repeat the question briefly. The question is, uh, what's the reason, historical or structural, why scientism continues so powerful in East Asia? Uh, a part of it is it uh, connected with Confucian paternalism. Uh, that's probably anti-democratic or soft or hard of our terrorism. And the first response uh, is uh, somewhat related to my earlier narrative about the emergence of the Enlightenment mentality. And Enlightenment mentality, some of the other values were relegated to the background, such as liberty and human rights. But uh, science 
became a, a very powerful symbol for saving the nation. It's a patriotic, it's a nationalistic. But science, instead, instead, of, under, under, uh, instead of understood as a kind of scientific spirit, as you know, Dr. Nasa was trained as a scientist, uh, studied at MIT. Now, the scientific spirit is a human spirit. But scientism is an ideology. The belief that you can use technology, you know, technology becomes deified. You believe you can use the secular world and uh, totally, uh, totally politicize a scientific ideology to change everything. That won't work. Now, you look at the Confucian tradition as undergone four generations of transformation. Uh, from the, uh, from the period, uh, period of Kang Youwei and Ang Qitao to Xiong Shi Di and Mo Zongshan, and uh, of course to the new generation, we say at least four generations. So there's a continuous critique of the outmoded paternalism. So Confucianism was criticized as uh, male oriented, as author authoritarian, as hierarchical. But some of these brilliant Confucians were very powerful in terms of their self-reflexivity. So the new identity is both open, pluralistic, and self-reflexive. So in this sense, Confucian spiritual humanism may turn out to be a very powerful source for critiquing this uh, totally deified uh, scientific uh, technology. Of course, it's a hopeful sign. And you can see the emergence of uh, Confucian humanism in all over China, uh, including what we call the recitation of texts by young children from 8 to 13. They recite these texts. And uh, when they started in Taiwan, now about a, one million in Taiwan, but uh, for the last 10 years, according to one account, approaching 10 million Chinese children now can recite these texts. And of course, in these texts, it's human flourishing in the most or comprehensive, you can say, anthropocosmic way, and which is diametrically opposed to scientism narrowly defined. My question was already more than centered by Professor Nasser's last part that there's one God, but many, many different ways. I mean, scripture studies and scripture study of religion, my question is would there be a convergence? the real convergence of uh, uh, similarity among worlds. Given the, given the fact that each religion is unique in its own way, in terms of its teachings, spiritual practice. And there are, of course, concrete differences between Islam and Christianity. Uh, Islamic vision of emphasizing God, one God, salvation, divine revelation, divine uh, uh, wisdom, and so on. Whereas Confucian tradition of uh, uh, discussing the death, heaven, uh, self cultivation learning, uh, and so on. So, despite our often quest for uh, searching for the convergence among our religion, there are powerful differences in terms of language, and philosophy, uh, and so on. So, how, how, how is it possible to develop a global language, one that would, would unify uh, the differences among our religions? Similar to the other questions, and will there be in the future a convergence of, of different religions around certain values? What will happen to the differences uh, that, that, that will never go away? There's a difference between uh, convergence and the dissolution of different components in a single reality. Many people think that the problems of the world can be solved by having a kind of global religion or world religion and that all of the religions should converge to make one single world religion with putting their common values together. I stand completely against this. I believe that all of the religion comes from the divine and this is the purely human invention and all the attempts since the 19th century by a number of religious movements even within the Islamic forces of Baha'is and in the Christian world, within the Buddhist world, Soka Gakkai, and many, many different worlds have ended up in nothing. Have ended up in nothing. But that's very different 
from the religions being able to point to their common values in order to be, face a world in which every single one of them is threatened. I think that uh, is bound to happen more and more. But we're having a lot of ups and downs. As, let's maybe you, give you a counter example. But China, if that's not the case, but between Islam and the West, uh, after a thousand years in which the problem of Islam was vilified by Latin texts going back to the 11th century all the way down to the 19th century, whether you were the Bishop of uh, Paris or Oriental St. German University would more or less write this or would appear to us Muslims what the nonsense about the problem of Islam. Things gradually began to improve. And uh, a number of especially British scholars in the early 20th century, like Mongolian, Sir Hamilton Gibb, in France, Louis Massignon, Louis Gardet, Le Dancorbin, people like that, uh, in Germany a bit less, but also some German scholars, especially later on, Anna Marie Schimmel wrote a remarkable book on the problem of Islam. They began to try to remove some of these old historical prejudices so there could be a meeting between the, the religions. And uh, suddenly, after 9-11, uh, much of this was undone, not all of it. Much of it was undone. Uh, and the Christian right, in cohorts with the four extreme forms of Zionism and other elements, came together. And the vilification of the problem of Islam became central to the scene in the United States politically correct, you cannot criticize anybody. You cannot even criticize Geronimo, some American Indian would protest, and uh, you get, uh, not, not the blacks, not the Jews, not the, the Orthodox, not the Catholics, I uh, guess through the 19th century. The only thing that's free game is Islam. You make movies, you can have Pat Robertson go on the television every night and curse Islam, and this is not a laughing matter. It shows that this process of conversions doesn't smoothly flow historically. There are a lot of uh, co uh, confrontations, conflicts, events that can turn it about. And you see another sign in a very different world with the rise of Hindu nationalism and the BJP and the kind of fascistic interpretation of Hinduism. You see what is happening in Gujarat. And of course, on the other side, of uh, most of the it's come from Kashmir and other places Kashmir problem is such a sore in the eyes of everybody, both Muslims and Hindus, that the relation between Hindus and Muslims today is in many ways much worse than it was decades ago. Some of you in talking Mahatma Gandhi and for the centuries when they used to live together and all these common theologies, translation of sacred texts, much more than Chinese, the translation of Upanishads into Persian and the Bhakti movement uh, in relate to Sufism. All of this has now been to some extent eclipsed by current events. So I feel there is a general flow towards a greater accord between religions. But there are also many, many obstacles, many, many obstacles to be overcome. But that must not be confused with the attempt to create a kind of United Nations religion, which many people have tried to do. Uh, and I've been approached through the last 50 years by many organizations to participate in this kind of thing, which I refuse to do, because I believe that the authenticity of religion is like the authenticity of a high cultural work. If a Sung painting and Rubens were combined and make one single style of painting, the world would suffer. <laughs> the world would suffer. And the, the beauty of each religion, its spirituality, its sacred forms, its art, its metaphysics, that is something very, very precious, as precious as that Sung painting, even more so. And so uh, I have always stood against the confusing between rapprochement between religions and the dilutions of religions into a kind of least common denominator world movement of some kind, which will never move the souls of men and women. Anyway, yeah, that, that I totally agree. <laughs> and uh, we try to avoid uh, universe, a uh, kind of abstract universalism. This kind of, uh, you know, an ecumenical, seemingly ecumenical way is like Esperanto. You know, Esperanto cannot become any kind of literature 
the person who advocated uh, Bernard Shaw, of course, noted for his English expression. Now, yeah. well, this attempt now to believe that, say, 50 years from now, there's only one language that matters. And uh, Richard Rorty, who is a very famous American philosopher, once made the remark, after visit China, as it may be two, but in any way, <laughs> the, uh, the diversity of language probably persists. You know the worry, the serious worry of uh, French intellectuals. On the other hand, it is very important to avoid closed particularism, especially in closed particularism that becomes aggressive, becomes uh, uh, not only aggressive, but at the same time to believe that truth is only manifested in a very small group of, uh, of followers. So we need to avoid the two. But at the same time, the importance of the dialogue among civilizations is not to find the lowest common denominator. It's to engage in a very thick self-reflection. And we want to involve in a dialogue between the Confucian who is deeply involved in the Confucian culture, in Confucian philosophy, in Confucian history. And that's true. I would like to engage in a dialogue with Dr. Nasa because he's deeply involved in the tradition, in understanding it. And yet that's open. You know, the image that I have is like digging a well. The deeper you dig into the well, the closer you come to the common spring of communication. So if you allow yourself to be totally abstracted from your roots, from your own traditions, you may be very ecumenical, may be very free, but um, inevitably it will be very superficial. And what we want to do now is not the global village uh, in a very superficial sense. You know, the global village is now noted for difference, conflict, contradiction, and even outright discrimination. What we need is uh, dialogue begins with uh, tolerance, but it's not enough. It has to be involved in recognition. Recognition, the, irreducible, uh, the irreducibility of the dialogical partner. They have respect. With respect, there's possibility of mutual reference, mutual learning and even to celebrate difference. And I like uh, Clifford Gibbs, even though I don't like his relativism. Clifford Gibbs' notion that you can, if you confront radical otherness, it may turn out to be a liberating experience. Instead of imposing your narrow-minded rationality on something, if you don't understand, you try to appreciate. You try to uh, extend your own horizon. Deep listening is important. Now I think we've lost it. And in the in the interreligious dialogue, not only we learn we have to learn to listen, but also try to extend our horizon and to deepen our self-reflexivity. It is not an occasion for conversion, not an occasion for making statements imposed upon the other, not even an occasion for trying to correct perceived misunderstanding. It is really uh, a genuine communication for mutual reference. So both are beneficiaries, and uh, your own sense of your own tradition becomes deeper because this kind of thing can interchange. Our last question, perhaps. Thank you. I came from China. My name is Yujewa. I am a visiting scholar of Georgetown University. Actually, in China, I work for the Institute of World Religions. The Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I met Professor Du Weiwei in the second dialogue conference in Yichuan. So I'm very happy to meet you here. I have a very short question. I want to ask is this kind of dialogue or inter inter interaction between these two great tra traditions sustainable or possible in, in current China? For me, in my appearance, uh, I think the Chinese Muslims are experiencing a re-Islamization nowadays. That means, in certain degrees, that means it, they are trying to get getting rid of the confusion, the other other elements, uh, such as the confusion, these elements from the 
Chinese <coughs> flag. So uh, I, I want to know your opinion about that. That's it. So, so this is my question. <laughs> but since you work in the world uh, Institute of World Religions, I'm sure you have some uh, really uh, informed uh, answers. If you look at China, maybe 96 to 97 percent Chinese are uh, Han Chinese. So that's huge. But even with that 8 percent or 7 percent so-called nationalities, we're still talking about millions, 80 million or more. Now, the question you talk about Islamization of the Muslim community and become somewhat close to other religious traditions. And this is not my experience. I was involved in these dialogues. I think uh, the Han Chinese will become more reflexive. And I think one problem, you know, I said it in China, so I could repeat it here as well. The leadership, the leadership in the 21st century, no matter what kind of leadership, whether it's in government, in uh, business, or in the academic community, ought to be musical to religious matters, or sensitive to religious matters. Ought to be sensitive to questions of identity. Now, the Chinese leadership, generally speaking, um, maybe the term is a little bit too strong, they are autistic to uh, religion on one hand and the identity on the other. They want all these nationalities to become, quote, synthesized for the wrong reason. And that is related to this glorification of science and technology. We are giving you uh, all kinds of public facilities. We give you money. We raise your standards of living. Uh, we try to give you something that is well that make you more uh, powerful and make you wealthier. But I will respect what you have. I don't have any interest in your religion, in something deeply move you. Uh, that's the problem with Tibet. That's the problem with the non-Chinese speaking um, Muslims. What the leadership ought to do now is to say, well, if they feel it so strongly, there must be some reason. You know, let's, let's take an example. Uh, maybe neutral in this conversation, the Christian. If you try to provide all kinds of uh, external values, such as money and power and so forth, if the person is a genuine Christian, if you say the only thing you should give up is your faith, you don't be a Christian, you be a Confucian, right? You be a communist, and we'll give you all these things. You're not going to seduce an authentic Christian to be done that. So you need to have that sensitivity. So one thing we need to do, if we perceive, I think we can perceive examples, you know, in the case of Zhang Zizhen, I think you, you may have in mind, uh, this uh, very radical, young uh, Muslim writers and thinkers, they are very, very hostile to the larger environment. But that hostility has to be understood as being perceived by them, being uh, humiliated, uh, being undermined, being relegated to the background. So I think uh, some, some kind of two-way traffic will have to be developed. And also I'm aware of the fact uh, that they are, the government is very much worried about certain kind of uh, alliance between the non-Chinese speaking Muslims and of course Central Asian, uh, Central Asian uh, Muslim powers. Uh, they are for the United Front that were threatened to China's uh, uh, not just integrity in terms of sovereignty, but stability. But I think even if you have that sense of worry, uh, still to understand the uh, nationalities. You know the famous uh, anthropologist Fei Xiaotong? Uh, China is Bo Yuan Yi Ti. It's, uh, it's one nation, but with many, many different manifestations. And now we put too much emphasis on oneness without any appreciation of the multiplicity of uh, cultural expression. last comment by making a joke, which is not really a joke, but we were in Beijing. We were taken by our host, Dr. Wu Bingbing, who's a professor at the University of Beijing and also in an Arab business for some years in Syria and very far man. We simply have a lot of uh, Islamic 
restaurants. I want to take you there. So every long restaurant that would take us to do uh, your very good food, they would play music and they had dancing girls. And uh, I, I was very surprised that they were none of them look Chinese. I, I said to him, "What? What is in the middle of China? First of all, what is this phenomenon?" So all you not know the Chinese we love dancing girls, but the Chinese women don't know how to dance. They're all Uyghur. So, <laughs> so I guess. The, the minorities play some role. But, <laughs> but joking aside, uh, I could not agree more with uh, Tu Weiming and all the later comments he made. I, I'm not in a position to make any comments about China. But the fact that uh, Xinjiang, uh, which was called Turkestan, Shabri, Eastern Turkestan in Islamic geography, and until 1860, the fairly recent times was called Eastern Turkestan, Turkestan Shabri, has certain proclivities and attractions towards Central Asia with the demise of communism and the rise of the local cultures of Central Asia, which are of course Islamic. That attraction is going to increase, there's no doubt about that at all. And it's going to cause a geopolitical problem for China, uh, not less important than uh, Tibet, perhaps even more difficult to manage in the future, there's no doubt about that. But there's, and within that context, nevertheless, uh, the harm, harmonious way for Muslims within China to live with the majority on population, uh, I think is extremely important. And I felt that, putting the Xinjiang problem aside, I spoke to many, many Muslim leaders who came to see me from different places, that it's not going badly. It's not going badly at all, and that perhaps just due to mutual interests that China has with such countries as Pakistan and Iran and, and the role in Central Asia and the future of oil in Central Asia and the role that Iran can play to prevent American hands from reaching Central Asian oil and all of the practical things that are going on. That these may be elements which will help uh, the Islamic population within China itself play a more important role intellectually also as a bridge between China and the Islamic world and uh, also uh, bring China closer to the Islamic world intellectually and not only economically as, to some extent politically, as seems to be the case. But I think the concern of myself and Dr. Uh, Tuwemi is way beyond these contingent matters. Uh, we're thinking of really the future of the human state in this world and the importance of the understanding without which uh, human life cannot continue both on the level of understanding the other religiously and not vilifying the other, qua the other, and also accepting the other, the other other, which is nature, the world of nature, and not something simply to be dominated and destroyed, but something to be cared for and nourished without which we will not survive. And the battle that is at hand, both within China and within the Islamic world, is of the impact of the West, not only for the enlightenment, but of course all kinds of tremendous political and economic pressures that exist are also to a large extent mutual and I think the interaction between the two civilizations is bound to grow by leaps and bounds in the future. And at the heart of that lies the need for this understanding between uh, Confucianism and Islam. I know that the analysts of Confucius were translated to Persian many, many years ago, they retranslated many times that the Tao Te Ching has been translated into Persian at least 10 times, uh, not that much in Arabic, but uh, uh, in Turkish also. And uh, one hopes that this is the beginning of a long process of mutual recognition so that every Persian child who knows the name of Leo Tolstoy or Victor Hugo will also know the name of the Chinese writers and vice versa. Vice versa, every Chinaman who knows Kant and Hegel will also know the Islamic thinkers who were living next door to them for such a long time. Thank you. We thank our distinguished speakers and uh, Professor Dubemi that you wish you best uh, luck in your new job in Beijing and when you come to this city of Tomasi again. And Professor Nasser, as you know, teaches at George Washington University. Uh, Jewish, so I don't need that.
Tuition is very expensive, but you can try to go and sit in the back of the classroom and hope that nobody recognizes you and, and get out of the class. Uh, thank you all for coming, and we will have lunch waiting for you outside. Uh, we have only one table for our speakers reserved, but the rest is free seating. I hope you will try to mix uh, uh, based on your uh, expertise, whether it's our computerism. If your uh, table does not have a chair, please uh, grab it from the back because we, we took the dinner uh, lunch table chairs here. We didn't have lunch space. But thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you in the future events of, of Center for Islamic Studies. Thanks.